Good afternoon and welcome to our series of webinars focused on bringing you information about COVID-19 related topics. The information in these weekly webinars is geared toward long-term care and skilled nursing facilities, but we encourage everyone who is interested to attend. Today, we will be discussing reducing 30-day readmissions and avoidable emergency department trips. Everyone has entered this meeting on mute, but we will have a discussion at the end of the webinar. If you have questions or comments, please submit them using either the chat or the Q&A tool in your Zoom menu. We encourage you to join us every Wednesday at 2 p.m. for more of our weekly webinars. Next week will be a part two of today's discussion on reducing 30-day readmissions and ED trips. My name is Kathy Caudill. I'm a communications specialist with Quality Insights, and now I'd like to introduce our guest today, Patty Austin. Patty is a quality improvement specialist at Quality Insights. She has been working in the skilled nursing arena for the past 29 years, starting her career as a nursing assistant and leaving the front lines as director of nursing. Patty has been with Quality Insights since 2016. She considers it a privilege to be able to interact with so many different nursing facilities to help create lasting change within their communities. Patty, welcome and thank you for joining us again today. Hi, everybody. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and that you're taking just a quick breather before gearing up for the hecticness that Christmas brings. Today, we are gathering to begin a conversation that's going to continue for the next several years, really. We all know that providing the best care in the best setting has been and always will be one of our goals. The importance of this has been made even more obvious during the COVID pandemic. Sending our residents to the hospital or to the emergency department brings not only the same unwanted outcomes that we've long been aware of, things like increased confusion, exposure to outside illnesses, even the possible erosion of trust in our ability to care for our residents. But these trips to another healthcare setting now come with a whole new set of issues when our residents are exposed to COVID and then return to us. We all recognize that readmissions and trips to the emergency room are unavoidable at times. However, it is our responsibility to ensure that we have processes in place that will eliminate as many of those avoidable events as we can. To do this, for the, we do this for the good of our residents. We do it to lessen the load for our staff and to promote the well-being of our facility. And finally, we do it to show our commitment to our community. Today, we're going to look at the first of a two-part series on ways that we can take steps to ensure that we're doing our best to keep our residents with us when we can, and that we do transfer them when we should. So rehospitalizations and avoidable ER trips are reported via claims data into the nursing home compare system. We can quickly see where our states lie within the national arena. And by looking at the data that you see on the screen now, we can see that uh, we are doing pretty well when we look at where we fall, Pennsylvania and West Virginia fall as compared to the national average. And then, um, even beyond that, we can look and divide it out further into short stay and long stay um, measures. So if we use that national and state figure as a benchmark, it kind of sets us up to develop our own goals. Our goal is to look at what's working well and solidify our processes while also assessing for areas that might need improvement. As a community that stretches like beyond our state borders, we need to strive to share what's working well for us in the hope that others might benefit and in doing so increase the power our industry has to impact the lives of our residents, our staff and our nation. And that seems like a really big statement. However, the part that each of us can play really can't be overstated. That being said, a good starting point might be to consider pulling up your facilities QM report to see where you fall, where your piece fits into the national and state pictures. Oops. There we go. One other reason you might want to consider checking on your facilities rate is value-based purchasing, right? 
The risk adjustment reporting for year 2023 was released in August of this year, as it normally is, and a few changes were made this year. Imagine just for a minute what our readmission rates would look like if we were using the first part of 2021 uh, in the look back period. That was the height of the COVID pandemic. CMS recognized how skewed the readmission rates would be when you looked at areas with high outbreak levels and then compared those to those with low or no outbreak levels. For that reason, the first six months of 2021 have been completely excluded from the look back scan. Additionally, a risk adjustment calculation will be used for 2023 for residents who were either admitted to your facility with active COVID or a diagnosis of a history of COVID. And those changes were made to kind of level the VBP playing field, so to speak. Speaking of that playing field, let's jump into it ourselves. As with most of our big ticket items, the best place for us to start might be with a performance improvement project. If you currently have a subgroup in place to monitor things like readmissions and avoidable ER trips, that's a great place to start. If you don't have a subcommittee like that, then this is a great opportunity to initiate one. And that subcommittee then will most likely function long after your PIP is completed. Because of the widespread impact of rehospitalizations and avoidable ER trips, that subcommittee should meet routinely in the same way that things like a fall committee or a psychotropic medication committee or an infection control committee might. So as we look at the next few slides, we're gonna consider how to create the right team, promote your project, educate on the QAPI process, gather data, set goals, prioritize problems, complete a root cause analysis, and then put a plan in place to correct the cause of your issue. It's a lot to talk about. So everyone's going to have kind of a different idea of what the perfect team would look like. It's important to keep in mind that you want to include people on your team who are involved in the process as much as possible. Of course, your admission staff and the director of nursing are going to be key players. Um, they are the people that typically look at those admissions prior to their arrival at their facility, and they can help flag residents as being high risk even before they enter your doors. Your social worker might be perfect. She can help ensure that the discharge process goes well and that a post-discharge follow-up is indeed completed. A charge nurse, maybe from the shift with the highest readmit rates or the biggest ER sendouts would be a great addition. Maybe a nursing assistant who can provide that vital insight into that first 30 days of a patient's stay. And a physician to review your plan is always a great addition. I want to give a shout out here just for a minute to the dietary staff. Dietary staff can have insights that are sometimes easily overlooked. We'll share a little story. Just take a minute. I had a gentleman one time. And he is what we would probably refer to as a super user. Turns out he really liked the food that the hospital served. And periodically, he would just want to go over to the hospital for lunch, visit with the staff over there. He looked at it as his own personal outing. And he became very adept at feigning symptoms. And he was just sick enough that although we recognized what he was doing, we often couldn't take the chance and we would have to send him to the ER. Then we'd get a call from the ER who knew him well, as you might imagine, and he would be stable, visit, visiting socially with the staff and having a nice lunch. So that sounds funny, right? But really food plays a huge part in the lives of our residents. Are they prepared to maintain a healthy diet after we discharge them? Could an unhealthy diet then lead to a readmission that was potentially avoidable. 
And what can we do to support good choices once our residents are discharged from us from a dietary perspective? Maybe one of the most interesting people that you might want to consider bringing on to your team would be a resident. Now, maybe they couldn't come to every meeting because they wouldn't be able to hear those patient resident specific things that you would need to talk about. But really, who better is there to provide insight into those admission and discharge transitions or to really talk about what it's like to be the new resident on, on the hall, what the barriers are to that, what's difficult, what works well. And as with most things, involving a family member will always bring a needed balance to your team. Since we as caregivers can tend to get lost in our own world and overlook those real world stumbling blocks that so often lead to an event within 30 days of discharge. As you can see, creating a good team is way more than just saying, okay, these five department heads get to it, you're my new subcommittee. Thoughtful design of that team is most certainly going to lead to better outcomes. So very little can grow in the dark. That same principle applies to an initiative to reduce these measures. Let absolutely everybody know what you're doing why you wanna do it, and where they fit into the mix. Posters are a great way to do that, and they seem so routine that they're hardly worth mentioning. But there's a reason everything has a poster in our world. The exposure that posters can bring um, is absolutely beneficial, and you want the idea of right care in the right setting to be a common thread within the facility. Posters are effective in doing that without requiring a ton of time. However, the same poster in the same place for extended periods of time can kind of end up going unnoticed after a while, right? It's just kind of like the wallpaper on the wall. Consider changing posters and locations to keep the message fresh. I know of a facility that did kind of a Where's Waldo with their posters. Every couple of weeks, they would place a small sticker on some random poster somewhere within the facility, and whoever found it first would have to go to the director of nursing, say where they found it at, tell a little bit about what the poster was about, and then they would win a small prize. Sometimes it was a candy bar. Sometimes it was a gift card. I was told that what made aging was that no one ever knew when the sticker would appear and what the prize might be. So sometimes just keeping a fresh attention, a fresh perspective on those posters can enhance how effective they are for your facility. Meetings are gonna be important as you prepare. You might not need to have separate meetings, but in some way you need to convey to staff and to residents that you have a new project. They need to understand how they fit into that project. And then be sure to publicize your goal and consider what reward you're gonna offer when you do reach that goal. Your objective here is to create a buzz. And the more creatively you create that buzz, um, the more impact I believe it'll have. As always, goal setting is needed to drive your project. If we remember our SMART acronym, the process is so much easier. When deciding on your goal, it will need to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Consider the difference between a generic, non-smart goal, such as, we will eliminate avoidable ER trips. That's so broad that you're going to struggle with creating a plan, getting started, knowing if what you're doing is having a positive impact or not. You're going to struggle. If you apply the SMART technique, your goal might look more like we will reduce potentially avoidable emergency trips on the dementia unit from 14 per 1,000 resident days by 5% during the next quarter. That's very specific in that you're looking at a targeted population. It's measurable in that you know where you're starting from and where you would like to go. And you believe that 5% reduction is achievable. 
you know how important reducing those rates are, so it's certainly relevant. And finally, you have a timeline in place to which to, in which to achieve that goal by. What are we talking about next? Data. As always, that is going to be vital to your success. You need to know where you're starting from in order to understand where you want to get to. Some of the data you might want to look at for a readmission ER trip performance improvement project might be that internal data that you collect related to those areas. If you're not yet collecting facility level data, this PIP is the perfect place to put a system in place to begin to do so. It is um, super important that you are tracking what's happening in real time. The critical element pathway the one on hospitalizations is a great way to look at what your processes currently look like and then to identify areas that might not be performing as you thought they were and therefore be ripe for improvement. QM data is also a great way to look at where your facility lies related to national and state benchmarks. And remember that when you're collecting and analyzing your data, you need to compare apples to apples. For example, Rehospitalization rates are going to be different between seasons. Winter, we might typically expect to have higher rates than we would in the summertime. And ER trips might vary by unit. Maybe the dementia unit has a high number of ER trips related to falls, and you would need to consider those factors. Also, don't forget to look at post-discharge events as compared to those events that happen during a resident's length of stay. Interventions are going to look vastly different depending on what data you're considering. It can also be helpful if you assign the same person to collect groups of data. That's going to eliminate a difference in interpretation of what's being collected, as well as create a sense of accountability for this very important piece of your project. <laughs> Excuse me. I seem to be wanting to fly through my slides here. I apologize. There we go. The way you prioritize where you want to place that initial focus and then where you prioritize moving forward is really up to your facility to decide how you're going to do that. Just be sure that you do have a method that is well-defined and that you can speak to. This is mentioned several places within the federal regulations, and it's going to be helpful in removing any potential bias that might exist when you are choosing areas to work on. Prioritization sheets that assign scores to various elements are available for your use if you choose to prioritize by score. You can prioritize by the vote of your committee or even prioritize by vote of resident council or you can prioritize by choosing the area that has the largest impact on a specific targeted area. Again, really the decision is yours. Just be, be sure that you have it clearly defined and that you use it um, routinely. There we go. Once you've determined which area you would like to focus on first, the next step is going to be determine, to determine why that area is an issue. Root cause analysis is a great way to do that. Many ways to complete a root cause analysis, analysis exists, and we're always available to help you if you require some assistance in learning how to use one. For our purposes today, I'm going to highlight my personal favorite, the five whys. Remember when you're using a tool like the five whys to start your discovery with a very simple one sentence description of the problem to be solved. Something like, why is the dementia unit experiencing emergency department trips at twice the rate of the rest of the facility? When you take the next step and begin to question why, you're going to want to complete that why series with more than one person. 
you might want to ask someone from nursing, a non-nursing staff member, a family member might have insight into a situation that typically healthcare workers might not. Differing perspectives can often lead to causes that those of us who are closest to the situation just don't see. The most important message to convey when you're doing a five why scenario is to be sure that everyone involved recognizes that the intent is not to place blame, but to solve a problem. I also recommend that each time you get to that root cause, whoever you're doing with it with, ask them what they think the solution to that problem might be. Doing that's going to help just decrease that punitive feel that can sometimes happen when root cause analysis is used. And it's also going to help to foster a sense of teamwork, which will only benefit not only this project, but your community as a whole. Finally, after you have the root of your problem, you're going to complete a plan do study act cycle. You're going to start with that root of the problem. You might then have a brainstorming session to gather potential solutions for that problem, the root of that problem, and to help you to create a plan. Remember that interventions are trial during a PDSA and they're meant to be rapid cycle. What that means is that they're trialed on a small segment of the population and then quickly assessed or studied to see if they should be kept modified or maybe they're just not viable. But don't let the term rapid, rapid cycle improvement throw you off. Although each cycle should indeed be implemented, evaluated, and acted upon quickly, that doesn't mean that the intervention is put into place globally quickly. <laughs> you might have multiple plan, do, study, act cycles involving just a single intervention until you finally arrive at the one that you end up adopting globally. So as we bring part one of the right care in the right setting to a close, let's talk about what comes next. Our goal is to look at reducing rehospitalizations and avoidable ER trips, starting with pre-admission through the length of stay, the whole way to 30 days post-discharge from your facility. To do this, we'll look at creating processes within your facility and offering resources to assist in maintaining those systems. Next week, we're gonna look at some of those resources. We'll be talking about what participation in a work group might look like. And we're gonna take another look at what, that, what data we might need and what it will look like to collect that efficiently. I hope you're excited to jump on board with this initiative. And I certainly am looking forward to talking again next week. But for right now, I am going to pass it back to Kathy and take any questions you guys might have. All right. Yes, in a minute, we'll start the Q&A portion of this meeting. If you have a question or comment, please share them using either the chat or the Q&A tools in your Zoom menu. Or if you'd like to uh, audibly ask your question, raise your hand and we can invite you to unmute yourself. While we're waiting, I'd again like to invite everyone to join us for next week's webinar, continuing today's discussion that will be next Wednesday at 2 p.m. In addition to our webinars, we hold office hours twice a week. These are live chat rooms where you can stop by and someone on our team will be there to answer your questions or comments. Those office hours and live chats, uh, those office hours live chats are Tuesdays at 8 a.m. and Thursdays at 2 p.m. You can find the links to our office hours and webinars in the newsletter we send out each Friday called The Last Minute Lowdown. If you would like to receive that newsletter but don't think you're on the mailing list, you can email me at cclaudill at Quality Insights to sign up. I'll drop my email in the chat shortly along with Patty's information in case you need to get in touch with either of us. And now let's look to see if there are any questions. Now there's nothing so far, but I'll give everybody a couple minutes. I just put. Um, excuse me, my information and Patty's information in the chat if anyone needs that. While we are waiting, Kathy, I'm gonna give a shout out to a tool that was in last week's last minute lowdown, I think. A lot of the information that we talked about today is condensed 
into a tool called Recipes for Success located on our website. And it kind of summarizes all of the bullet points that we talked about today. So if you kind of need a little bit of a refresher on some of the things that we talked about, it's a simple front and back of one page. Um, kind of worth giving that a look. It'll give you maybe a little bit of a roadmap on how to get started. Thanks for mentioning that. So uh, I will be emailing everyone following this webinar with uh, with the recording to this webinar and along with the PowerPoint presentation slides, Patty, if you'd like to have us share those <clears throat> and I can include the link to that download as well. Thank you, Kathy. Sure thing. And that email will go out later this week. I sent it to everybody who registered for the webinar uh, using the email address that you use to register. So let's see, I don't see anything in the chat or the Q&A. Patty, do you want to give it another minute or have us wrap up here? I think that we are okay. We'll give everybody a couple of minutes back in your day, probably to hang good. some Christmas decorations and start that whole um, frantic rush to the 25th. Yep, tomorrow's December 1st, starting is kicking off. All right, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and hope you can join us again next week for part two. I uh, hope everyone has a good day. And Patty, thank you for joining us again. Thanks, everybody. Bye.